shit kind of went sour though, cause uh, you know he had a flood that destroyed a lot of shit. So I've I've been a victim of like three or four floods. So when that happens, it's kind of like it's like it never has that that feeling that it had. You're like, damn, like my shit got my shit got destroyed. Like let me get on some new shit. So you think that's why he moved to L.A.? That was probably one of the reasons. Eventually, one day he just called me up and he's like, Wolf, I'm moving to L.A. I was like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> You know, like, I, I could not, because he was just always repping the D so hard, you know, and it was just such a part of him. Villa was synonymous with Detroit for all of us, and all of us kind of regarded him as a mythic figure, even though Wolf had, you know, of course, done some work with him. He put out those bootleg remixes when he was at uh, TRC, and of course, I'd met him, and, you know, I think Mad had even met him or something, but he was still, like, this mythic figure that was all Detroit, and, you know, he would pop into these different cities, but, you know, he was clearly Detroit. You know, when you get older, you look for a certain type of vibe to do what you do. You know what I'm saying? Things got to be a certain way. And maybe Detroit just didn't have it for him anymore. He had used it up. According to my Dukes, I think he was kind of tired of Detroit. You know, Detroit was a real struggle for him. It was hard for him to stay there. The Detroit should have wear you out. I mean, I'm same thing, you know, I had to get, I could get out of there too. It can just kind of suck the life out of you. Out of all the times that I've been there, I think I've seen the sun once, you know? And it wasn't even for that long, you know? It's either snowing, raining, or overcast. Period. That's the D. Cats get tired of that cold and, and the winter and the rain and all that shit. And they just want to get as far away as possible without leaving the country and come out here and just, just get the love that they never got in their own city, you know? I mean, musicians throughout the history, like way before hip hop, the same shit's been going on for a long time. Whether you look at Marvin Gaye, the whole Motown scene, even before that, you go back to the era of cats like Paul Humphrey, but it's, it's, it's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a railroad for musicians between Detroit and Los Angeles that's existed for many generations. Well, Motown had offices in Detroit and L.A. I mean, you know, come on now. You know, there, there's, like, the electro scene, you know, in L.A. was humongous. That's how hip-hop started here was via electro. There wasn't much disco rap being made in Los Angeles, right? And, you know, even what's big was over here, where DJ used to do doubles, cut it up and stuff, was uh, uh, Cybertron. Uh, the song was called Clear. And a lot of people don't know that that uh, Cybertron is one Atkins, a, a, a famous... Uh, to, uh, Detroit techno producer. They had the electro thing kind of going with the parallels to like Cybertron and an Egyptian lover, like um, Juan Atkins and Egyptian lover are good friends and they, they were kind of making the similar music even though geographically it's so far away. So, you know, there was that going on in the early 80s and mid 80s and with Dylan Madlib, you know, I think they, they, they kind of continued that tradition. I mean, I honestly think that Madlib was a big reason why he moved here, and you know, I, I never talked to him about it, and um, there's no way to confirm or deny that, but that's just like how I felt about it. Dilla and Madlib had this, you know, energy that they shared, and it was obvious when they were doing the JLib project that the music they were sending back and forth was influencing the music that they were making. A lot of that was vocal performances, but you know, subtly you could hear it in the beats that Dilla would send through, you know, in the beats Madlib would send you know, to Dilla. And one of the tracks on the, the J-Lib record that always struck me as something that was influenced by Madlib was the, uh, that beat that Percy P rapped over for that interlude on the record, you know, chopped up drums, like, you know, super distorted vocal exclamations coming in and out. That reminded me of something, you know, that Madlib had influenced. And that interchange kicked into high gear when he moved to LA. Him and that Madlib hung out a little bit more, got into each other's styles a little bit more. Those those guys are like, they're like cousins, you know, they're like, they're, they're like almost mirror image of each other, you know, in some ways yin and yang, like, Dilla's a little bit more outspoken than, than Madlib and stuff, but their, but their, their spirits are the same, it's, it's like, it's, I even just remember just chilling in the back, I remember, I forgot what show it was, and we're chilling in the back, you hear Dilla go, yeah, and then you, you hear Madlib go, whoo, just whoo, you know, just one words, but they all communicate already exactly how, they, you know, they just like, you know, they'd be like giving each other pounds and then just smoke and just like, eh, 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 laugh, eh, you know, just 
just they don't have to have full conversation. It is almost like you watch them. They already know how they read you. They already know what they're talking. You know, thinking already. You know, they're just like, eh, you know, like it, it's funny. I think they're both kind of we're aliens as far as like they're just really out of this world. I mean, nobody makes music as well as they do. And I think Dilla felt like, wow, if there's finally a guy that I can relate to. You know, it's like I think when you're that talented, you get really lonely. Like there's nobody else on earth that can relate to you. Or, and they just, um, they yeah, they just had that music bond that was like really strong. I think, I think mentally it just kind of freed his mind, you know, like a different, it's a, a easier way, a better way of life out here compared to where we were. Like, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, I think he. Um, I think it just freed him up to be able to kind of think like, man, I can do whatever I want to do, even if I want to go back, because it was hard for him to go backwards. You know what I'm saying? Like, he likes staying ahead of the curve. But, you know, donuts was really loops and breaks. You know, I think moving out here from Detroit and leaving the studio behind him, you know, like a very fine, beautiful studio with a very killer Pro Tools setup. Um, that he had built up over time and taken a lot of that record company money and put it into the studio and then leaving that behind, I think, freed him up then to do the kind of work that he did when he was out here, which was much more like choppy, you know, sample oriented, um, just really about ideas. He'd already done so much with so many different artists as far as defining the Dilla sound before that, that I think he was probably sick of it at that point and he was ready to just change things enough that he was gonna define a new era. And so, yeah, he moved here, he limited himself to just the bare basics uh, as far as tools that he needed. I think he was playing around with, you know, an MPC. I think he had a, a Korg Electribe drum machine that he brought over to my house a couple times and he was really excited about that. Um, you know, turntables, just some basic sampling and maybe a couple keyboards. By the time I had started working with him, which was J-Lib, he was already starting to go for uh, a raw, he, you know, he kept on wanting to go for that raw sound, and that's what he talks about in Donuts and J-Lib and everything else, and everything was just more lo-fi, more hard-hitting, less point on the drums, less um, gating on everything and cleaning everything up. He wasn't really going for that at that point. It was let the noise bleed, let things sound, you know, uh, damaged and more destroyed, and that was kind of where he was coming from at that point. Yeah, he was just on, out here, he was just on a different phase, just on his loops. He was on chopping breaks and finding loops. He wasn't on his keyboard beats anymore. He wasn't on, he wasn't on any of that. He was just on some straight hip hop, find the record, dig it out, let me chop it. You know, he was on that vibe at that time. 